Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this event is already filled with amazing energy, and I'm so excited to be a part of it. Um, the stuff that Greg and Karen, even the video, have talked about are going to play off of a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, this presentation is called the Yes, No, Yin Yang. And I'm going to go through uh, some things, stories from my life, and I really want to craft the journey that you're all going to benefit from as well. So just to give you a little background, about five months ago, I saw a call for TEDx presentations, and you had to have your application in. Um, and much like most things in my life, I had about 24 hours to get it in there. And I kept thinking, well, what am I going to talk about? Um, a TED is supposed to be the presentation of your life. So you know, what have I done in my 37 years? And I started thinking, um, the first thing is I'm an English major who found a great job. So that's pretty remarkable, right? <laughs> Any English majors in the house say yes? <laughs> yes, a couple. Excellent. But I was thinking, well, actually, I'm an English major who has a bachelor's and master's in creative writing. I ended up in the banking industry uh, doing bank consulting. I have a great career. I managed to meet and marry the woman of my dreams. I've got some amazing kids. And I have a lot to talk about, but what am I going to craft this in? So the first thing I thought about was, you know, there's, there's two types of people in the world, right? Optimists and pessimists, right? And in this case, extreme pessimism. But that's too, that's too broad, because even though I'm optimistic, you know, not everything in my life is colored by optimism. And optimists don't just say yes to everything. So I started thinking a little bit deeper about the words yeses and noes. Because they're two of the simplest words in any language, and they pretty much cross cultures to all languages. And when I started thinking back over the course of my life, there's a couple specific things in my life that I said yes to that made all the difference in the world. And how, though, do we balance the yeses and noes in our lives? You can't say yes to everything, or you wouldn't have time for the things that are most important to you. So there is a duality there. There's a yes and no that's very important here. So I want to, again, share some stories with my life, and then let you kind of think about, you know, what's the evolution of language? How do kids learn to say yes and no? How do we as parents communicate yes and no to our kids? How does it all come about? Because I didn't know any of this, but I wanted this to be meaningful for myself as well as you. So I went through and researched all this stuff, and I'll share some stories with my life as well. Are you ready to hear some stories? Yes. yes. Okay, thank God you didn't say no, or this would have been the shortest presentation ever. So the first yes story in my life actually started as a no. And when you think of a, a children's author, and he's like, come around, kids, circle up, you don't really think of Shel Silverstein. Um, because he doesn't necessarily like, you know, look like the kind of guy who's really warm and embracing to kids. <laughs> Uh, but in the fourth grade, so 1984, 28 years ago, um, I had a chance on a Monday morning, my teacher said to the entire fourth grade class, um, there's a poetry contest. If you'd like to enter before the end of the week, um, you have a chance to go on this poetry reading. And I didn't think much of it, because um, I had to do the poem during class or after school. And after school, I'm not going to spend time doing poetry. Um, I don't think I'd ever even written a poem at that point. And any free time I had during school was going to be spent playing Oregon Trail, right? Anybody remember Oregon Trail? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So Monday came, Tuesday came, Wednesday, Thursday, the deadline on Friday. And the teacher said, hey, Mark, you know, why don't you just go ahead and try a poem? And so I thought, OK, I think Oregon Trail is broken or something. Uh, I'll try and write a poem. So I wrote a poem, and I thought, this is pretty good. I turned it in. A couple days later, I found that I won. And I immediately think, I'm the best poet in the world, right? I just won this contest. There's only one fourth grader who can win this contest. So I started thinking, gosh, I got to. I got to get new poetry friends. I got to get poetry clothes. <laughs> I got to get rhyming dictionaries. You know, I mean, all the things that a poet's supposed to do. And so I go talk to the teacher and say, "Can I have my poem back? I wanted to share it with my parents." And she said, "Oh no, we, we threw those away." <laughs> yeah, what? She said, "Oh, it was just a random drawing." Oh. oh. <laughs> okay, but I still remember that poem to this day. <laughs> and you can you could write textbooks of things I've forgotten about grammar school. I mean, literally, there's just textbooks of things I've forgotten. But I remember this poem, and I'm going to share it with you today. And it's only been uttered a couple times in the world, and you'll see why. Um, <laughs> it was, I am sad because of my dad. He had a bad day. Now here he lay. <laughs> oh, you can say, oh. Literally, an angel loses its wings every time I say that. That's how bad it was, OK? <laughs> Even for a fourth grader, that's literally how bad it was. But what did it expose me to? This is one of those, like, you must be present to win. Maybe there's some things in life that you just must be present to win for. Because I got to go to this Shel Silverstein reading. And Shel knew kids, OK? He's not Dr. Seuss. It's not, you know, everyone's going to eat green eggs and ham. Everything's all great. His life is filled with these odd curiosities, these oddities in life, you know, fear, et cetera. Like, ickle me, pickle me, tickle me, too. You remember them? Went for a ride in a flying shoe. It's great. There's coffee, mulligan stew. But at the end, ickle me, pickle me, tickle me, too, never returned to the world that they knew. And no one knows what's happened to dear ickle me, pickle me, tickle me, too. And there's things like this all around. Barnabas Browning was so scared of drowning, shut himself in his room, nailed his window shut, and cried so much he drowned himself. <laughs> but that's Shel Silverstein. 
because he gets kids. So it started me thinking, you know, what comes first with language? When kids learn language, um, you know, what comes first? And this is all stuff that I had to research in order to put this presentation together. And no comes first. It's literally a root behavior. Uh, one of the things I ran across was no and yes on genesis of human communication. And no, as a root behavior, literally when babies are rooting to try and breastfeed, they can do this, but they can't do this until three months old. It's literally a root behavior. And those of you who have kids, no is a very important word for them to learn because it allows them to communicate what they don't like. They can't really tell you what they do like. But by saying no, they're sharing with you what they don't like. And adults even carry this over. I mentioned I'm in bank marketing. There's a pioneer checking research out there, and you probably never knew that before today. Uh, the pioneer checking research understood that when you go to choose a checking account at a bank, you don't choose the one you like the most. You choose the one you dislike the least. So you look at the menu and you're like, eh, I don't like that one. I could never carry that balance. You know, oh, look at that service fee. Me. And that's literally the noise you make when you choose a checking account. Me. <laughs> but that's how we do it because we're not thinking people that sometimes feel. We're just feeling beings that sometimes think. And no is also, like I said, that root behavior. It keeps the status quo. It keeps what we know. If you've ever done like change consulting or gone into a business and said, hey, we're going to change everything about your checking products, now we train you at whatever, hell no, you're not. That's just a natural reaction. People don't like change. They want to keep the status quo. And it's kind of evolution at work. A couple of the other articles I read, one was just published yesterday in Slate Magazine. It was phenomenal. Um, talking about you know, all this years, hundreds of thousands, millions of years of evolution, that when we see things like, we think about our taxes, or we know we're late for a meeting, we get this anxiety, this no feeling. Because it was a predatory response. It was to encourage you to avoid predators and to warn the others. These things are still rooted in us. And as children, think about as parents, this is, this is a, an interesting thing for me as a, a parent of a five-year-old and a three-year-old, is how do I say yes and no to my kids? The positive affirmations versus the discouragements. And just by economic standing, when you look at the classes from a professional class to a working class family to a welfare family, the ratio of positive affirmations to negative affirmations changes dramatically. From a six to one, yes, you can do that, or yes, we can go uh, to the zoo, yes, I'll buy you a pony. I mean, this is pretty high income. Um, <laughs> down, though, when you get to the welfare family, one yes to every two discouragements. So over the course of the year, we're talking about going from 166,000, yes, we can do this, to only 26,000. It's an 85% decrease. And on the nose, from a 26,000 to 57,000, 118% increase. It's like 71 nose per day on the low end, up like 151. As a parent, this does influence how your kids are going to perceive the world. And again, being exposed to Shel Silverstein, to me, was that was a world where he understood there's no's, uncertainties, et cetera. He understood there's yeses too, but he understood that the kid's mindset is that there's a lot of no's. So then I went, and that was obviously something that impacted me. I ended up getting my bachelor's in English and a master's in creative writing. And when I got to writing, I was first trying to figure out, how do I write stories? Um, I did the cardinal sin of any beginning fiction person. Nothing really happened in my stories, and everybody killed themselves at the end. Oh, <laughs> horrible. I'm sure there's a fiction. Somebody's taught fiction in this classroom before. You know this is just something that the, the entry-level fiction author has to go through to get to a, a good place. But my first fiction teachers were like, Mark, You've got to have your characters doing something besides killing themselves at the end of the story. <laughs> have them choose life, right? <laughs> Say yes to that. But the important thing as I learned to develop the craft of fiction is yes puts a character in motion. Nothing really happens until a character says yes. You don't want to read about stories that are just about, you know, someone sitting there going on the bus, going to their job, going home to their kids and family where nothing happens. We read to escape some things and to, to get exposure to new ideas. So yes puts a character in motion, and nothing happens in a story until your characters are in motion. And it's also in safe environment, because as the author, you control it all. So at the same time I'm going to grad school, I'm also working uh, at the Garden Cafe, waiting tables. Anybody remember the Garden Cafe? Oh, tragic that it's no longer here. Uh, the Garden, Garden, Garden Cafe, we love food. You remember that? That thing was on the air all the time. So I'm waiting tables at the Garden Cafe, and one day, two uh, late 20-year-old women walk into the restaurant. And I'd seen them there before, but never waited on them. And I went over, went through the daily specials, here's the soups, et cetera, um, get them their drinks, come back. One orders mashed potatoes and a cinnamon roll. Very odd. The other one asks about the chili. She says, are there a lot of beans in your chili? And I instantly knew what she was talking about. I love chili, but I hate beans. Anybody in here like... Very low bean chili. Okay, there's, we meet on Thursdays at 7 o'clock. We have a little support group. But there's really not that many of us out there. But the woman said that. I said, yeah, it's got a lot of beans in it. And the woman who ordered the mashed potatoes and cinnamon roll said, can you pick the beans out of my, wife's, or my friend's chili? 
yeah, why not? You know? <laughs> Honestly, as a writer, I'm learning that you know, there's odd things that can happen that can, that can change the whole course of a story. So I went back and ladled the soup, pulled all the beans out, gave it to them, got a nice tip, didn't think anything about it at all, and left the garden cafe shortly after that to go wait tables somewhere else. And uh, then about 10 months after that, I was at a bar, Bodega's Alley, you know what Bodega's Alley is? <laughs> and I run into the, to the cinnamon roll and mashed potato woman. <laughs> I know, exactly. And we didn't talk about the beanless chili or anything like that. I mean, we talked about whatever. She'd seen me write an article for the Daily Nebraskan that week in the paper, so it was kind of a little serendipitous. Um, and we talked for a while, and I asked, you know, are you seeing anybody? She said, no. Are you seeing anybody? No. Can I have your number? Fantastic. The next day, she went to work, and she told her coworker, who was the chili lady, guess who I met last night? Beanless Chili. <laughs> That's what they'd been calling me <laughs> for 10 months. Beanless Chili. They'd go in, I wonder whatever happened to Beanless Chili. And I, I, I saw Beanless Chili last night. He asked for my phone number. Beanless Chili called me. We were going on a date. Four months later, Beanless Chili asked me to marry him. And then 10 months after that bodega's meeting, oh my god, I married Beanless Chili. <laughs> she eventually found out my name and all that stuff. But, but that was just a curious story where, again, the yes to picking the beans out of someone's chili made a very interesting course of my, my story. My life story changed from there, too. And I say serendipity is kind of like an odd thing, you know, serendipitous, uh, an odd life-changing event in a beneficial way. But I've become more mindful of the idea that we do control our ability to take advantage of things that seem to be serendipitous. That was truly a serendipitous moment. But in my life now, this is a picture of a unicorn, which I named Serendipity. My daughter, who was four years old last year, asked, can you draw a unicorn? Sure. Drew a unicorn. Does, this, does that look like a unicorn, I asked her? She goes, not very much. <laughs> and it doesn't. It looks tragic, right? So we'll go back to Shel Silverstein and look at his unicorn. And this is a story where I said yes in my professional life. And to me now, yes is like, how can I create something brand new? So yes, in this case, was into it. Um, is a, a, a company that contacted me. I do blogging for the bank marketing industry. I said, would you like to write a blog post about social media? I said, absolutely. Can it be about unicorns? Because I just drawn that unicorn. I figured, well, hell, I've got to share this out there somewhere. <laughs> they said, um, we're not sure what you're talking about. I said, just trust me. They said, we do re reserve the right not to publish this. I said, I understand. <laughs> So I wrote a four-part series of blog posts about how hunting for social media return on investment for banks is kind of like hunting a unicorn. It's just something fun. It's very much part of my personality. Um, and banking's kind of stodgy. So it was a chance for me to get to write something original. And two days later, JD Power and Associates, they contacted me. Their social media department head was saying, would you like to come speak at um, the McGraw-Hill building in New York to the top 20 banks in the United States doing social media? Absolutely. So yes was more about, you know, I don't consult on social media. Um, I sell direct mail pretty much for most of my time. But it was a chance to get out there and do something brand new. And so yes has evolved to me for a lot of different ways. There's a no moment with Shel Silverstein that turned into a yes. Yes to picking out beans out of chili. And now I feel like when I actively go out and put myself out there, I'm trying to create these yes moments. But again, thinking about the no, when I was researching this, I've had five months to think about what I'm going to say today. And I did like, you know, what is the no moment, or researching no. Because when you say no, like when we watch the Nebraska Huskers, oh, no. You can feel that anxiety, right? And so researching the no moment, just on Google, I kept running across the tsunamis from 2004, something I hadn't really thought about in quite a few years. It's been eight years since that, on the day after Christmas. And watching the videos, it was like some of the tourist videos. It must have been an HBO special that was spliced up and put on YouTube. And my wife was at the Ian Thompson Forum event that night. Our kids were asleep, and I watched like 60 minutes of the tsunami videos. And it's, it's not exactly fun to watch that, because you see like a tourist videotaping in the distance of the waves coming in. And they're like, is that a, is that a tsunami? It's like, no. And then it's like, you know, no, no, no. And it comes. And then we watch as like the families like see their departed loved ones, like show up pictures at the morgue. And there, there's our daughter. And no. And so for me, about six and a half years ago, when my wife and I were pregnant with our first child, we were going in for like a second ultrasound. Everything was great. We we're just going to find out the sex of our baby. And instead, we get told we have to go see our doctor. And we go in there. And the doctor's just telling us about all the stuff that, that's wrong with our baby, all the genetic problems. And he's not going to live. And you'll never take him home to the hospital. And no, no, no. 
and then, you know, here's your options, whatever, and the options aren't really options, it's not the great stuff or whatever, and we deal with it, and like every day, kind of after that, it felt like I was in like this hole and just looking up at like a well, and I wanted to be in that hole, I wanted to be in that no hole, where no one could hurt me. But then very shortly after that, it was, yes, you can try again, and yes, we're pregnant, and yes, this is our daughter, Margo, and it was just a, go from that no to that yes, to me, that's, that's what life's about. And then again, thinking about all those no moments, when people say no, it's because sometimes they say yes and they fail, and they think about the failure. And that dominates their feelings by going into the next moment where they have a chance to say yes or no. But yes, people don't necessarily regret failure. They regret the times they didn't seize the moment, they didn't, their non-attempts when they didn't put themselves out there. And that's one of those things, like, I mean, Greg talked about it earlier, uh, Kara talked about it, you know, it's that fear a lot of times, no is our fear, that predatory instinct. We don't want to go out and hunt the, hunt the, you know, the dinosaur. We want to stay in, protect ourselves. That's very natural. But now it's become something where we don't consciously always think about yes and no in our life. And it changes over time. So in the short term, you get your ass handed to you, okay, like we did. It's all you think about. You don't want to put yourself out there. But long term, the psychology of regret says when you're on your deathbed, you're going to be thinking about the times when you didn't put yourself out there and seize that opportunity because time kind of heals all those wounds. So when you're thinking about, you know, the yes moments make a life, we say I do to our spouse. There's me with the 1221 Avenue of the Americas, the J.D. Power Associates Conference, my beautiful kids, my beautiful wife. <laughs> and Shel Silverstein said, you know, he's got whole books filled with like the no stuff, but listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts, listen to the shouldn'ts, listen to the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never haves and listen close to me. Anything can child happen. Anything can be. And it's even more dramatic when you think about, I love this one, the magic carpet, is that you all have a magic carpet that will whiz you through the air to Spain, Maine, or Africa if you just tell it where. So will you let it take you where you've never been before, or will you just buy some drapes to match and use it on your floor? Because <laughs> you have the power. I mean, yes and no. I met an entrepreneur last week. Who I just saw he's in here somewhere. Um, he was talking about when he quit his job and went to start on his own, 75% of his coworkers were like, oh, I wish I would have done that a long time ago, or I wish I had the balls to do that, et cetera. And it's like, you can. You're, you're, you're struggling with certain questions or yes or no or whatever. Just understand what the no is stemming from, the fear that somebody talked about earlier. Um, but you can control it. And you know, yes is what makes a life. Thank you very much.